<laughs> people don't understand their natural advantages, yeah. and they don't use them. So th that's that's bad, number one. But worse, number two, is they don't, if you don't think you're a good ice skater, or if you're convinced you're not a good cellist, you're not going out and try it. But people are buying stocks anyway. Yeah. They're not discouraged. They just think it's a gamble. Yeah. We begin with Peter Lynch. Time Magazine has called him America's number one money manager. During the 13 years, he headed the Fidelity Magellan Fund. It was a top-ranked general equity mutual fund. His new book, Beating the Street, offers advice on picking stocks and maximizing profits. And he's here to talk to us about a lot of things, including his own dramatic decision, uh, what, four or five years ago, Peter, welcome to the broadcast. Right. Four or five years ago, you just said, and I'm yep. managing all yep. this money, I'm going to do, I'm going to quit. I'm gonna... Yep, that's right. And, what, and you went to do what? Well, actually, I wanted to spend more time with my wife and my children. Right. And it was, it was an interesting situation because I loved my job, I adored my job, right. and, I, and I liked outside and activities. And when I, when I was young, you know, I, I didn't, wasn't involved in charity work until I was 30. Yeah. No activities. Younger children, you just read them a book and good night moon and they fall asleep and it's all over. And when, when they get older, there's, you know, there's more time involved. So I enjoyed the family. But I was, I was leaving for work at 6 in the morning. I was getting home at 7 o'clock at night, six days a week. This was in Boston? Yeah, traveling 14 days a month. It was just too much. So I said, you know, I, I said, that's it. I can't take it. And fortunately, I had made enough money to say I could give up the job. So I didn't have to give up the family or the outside activities. And so what happened then? So you did what with your well, life? Well, I cut back from about a 80, 80 90 hour a week to a 40 or 50 hour a week. And I, in the morning, I make breakfasts and lunches for the kids. And I do the spelling words and the Spanish <laughs> yes. words. And Carolyn does the math and the science. And I... Uh, see Carol in the morning and off I go to a place. You have to go, some, in my opinion, you have to go somewhere to do something. If you stay at home, you wind up answering the telephone or watching cartoons. So I, uh, <laughs> yeah, so you, or falling asleep, taking somewhere. a nap. So she does the hard work. And I go, I go <laughs> Fidelity gave me an office. I have a secretary. And I spend majority of the time working on charity things like inner city schools, yeah. inner city libraries, inner city housing. You know, helping people manage their money? or No, them, not at all. None just, of that. No. Just I'm, some of the charities I'm on the investment committee right. of, of some of the Museum of Fine Arts. The, you yeah. know, I'm involved in Mass General Hospital. Boston College, yeah. but United Way, but it, the, the, all the extra things I added to were real hands-on, actually being involved in charitable activities. You wrote a book called One Up on Wall Street, right. and I think that's one of the best-selling books ever about Wall Street, if right. I'm not right. correct, and you right. can correct me. Right. And so, so why then did you write another okay. book? Okay, okay. First of all, I was very lucky. I wrote it with John Rothschild. He, was, <laughs> he, was made, he made a big difference. So he, but I think the reason I wrote it is the first, I try to explain to people their great advantages, their edges they have and that they should get involved in stocks. Right. And they should do it on the right basis. This was on the first book. Right. Yeah. And obviously, I didn't make a great impression because the percent of people's assets involved in stocks has gone down. In 1960, people had 40% of their financial assets, including their house, yeah. in stocks and mutual right. funds. In 80, that was down to 25%. It's now down to 17%. And why do you think that is? Well, I think people in the decade of the 80s was the best decade this century for stocks. I think people managed to lose money in the 80s doing it themselves because their, their methods were so flawed. So I, th I really feel as though I wanted people to understand. I don't want anybody to buy a stock. I'm saying if you're yeah. going to buy a stock, you should do certain things. Right. If you're not willing to do these things, you should leave your money in the bank. Right. Your, your philosophy is, is simple, and I'm remembering this from the previous book. I right. think we're now talking about the previous book. Correct. Your right. philosophy was if you find something that you identify with. I remember right. there was a story yep. of yep. your wife and her hose. Yep. Your wife oh, kept saying, these the are pan oh, you legs, got it. Yep. Yeah, legs and panties. Your wife said, these are the greatest <laughs> things I've ever seen. Right. right. And when your wife said that, you knew that this was a product that right. was better. Right. You used to stay at La Quinta Motel. Right. And it was, the service yeah. was better, yeah. whatever was yeah. better. Right. The and price so, was good. And too. the price was good, too. Yeah. And you yeah. said, this is a place right. that I can determine. Right. I, Peter right. Lynch, right. Right. can tell that this is a good product, right? That's right. And if these people make it a good product, then their earnings are going to go up. Therefore, the stock's going to go up. Right. And I that's the kind of decision-making process you ought to go through. Right. Do I have it? You've got it exactly right. Well, I, do, I don't think people understand there's a 100% correlation with what happens to a company's earnings over several years and what happens to the stock. If the company, McDonald's, has done very well as a company, right. the stock has done very well. People worry about too much money supply, what's happened to the price of oil, whether, who's the president, <laughs> yes, who's being nominated for the Supreme Court, it's all the ozone earnings. layer. It has nothing to do. McDonald's earnings go up the next 10 years, the stock will go yeah, up. Yeah, but what they will say to you, Peter, is that, as you know, and why am I telling you this, but anyway, it's fun to tell you this, they're telling you that these other things influence the amount of earnings of a particular company. Yeah. If we're in a recession, people right. are not going to spend That's as right. much money on going to the movies Absolutely. or whatever they do. Right, right. 
and, and therefore you got to pay attention to these right. other things because yep. they impact on earnings. They are very important, but you have no idea of knowing what they're going to do. Alan right. Greenspan's the head of the Federal Reserve. Right. He cannot predict interest rates. Yes. He'd be the first to tell He can you. influence them, but he can't predict them. He cannot predict what long-term interest rates are going to be one year from now, two years from now, three years from now. He's even surprised how low they are now. Right. So how am I supposed to predict interest rates? How am I supposed to predict the economy? You certainly remember the recession of 82. Yes. 1982, we had a 20% prime rate, 14% unemployment, 12% inflation. I don't remember anybody telling me in 1980 or 81 that was going to happen. Yeah. All of a sudden, we had the worst recession since the Depression. I didn't read about it in the paper. So it's crazy to think about these things. <laughs> Here's a quote from you. I own Dunkin' Donuts. When you own Dunkin' Donuts, you don't have to worry about Korean imports. You don't have to worry about M2 or M3. These are money supply figures, right. aren't they? Yep. And, and what's happening to the money supply? This is the way you make money. If you don't understand what the company does, you should not be in it. If you could predict the stock market, you could predict the economy, you could predict interest rates. If you go buy the wrong stocks, you're going to lose half your money anyway. Right. Yeah. You, I, I'm saying people have natural advantages. Yeah. Let's say what you do for a living is you're involved in the restaurant industry. Right. You supply paper products. You, right. you supply kitchen equipment. You help build restaurants. Right. You saw McDonald's. You saw Chi Chi's. You saw Chili's. You saw Cracker Barrel. You saw Dunkin' Donuts, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Taco Bell. These are all these success were, stories. These were 40-fold. 40, 40 you made 40 or 50 times your yeah. money. You don't need to make that kind of money many times in your life, right? Yeah, no, no. That's all you had to do was follow the restaurant industry. Yeah. People are in industries. They're in the publishing industry. They're in the chemical industry, the paper. Why don't they just stay with that industry? You only need a few stocks a decade. How many good stocks do you need in a lifetime? <laughs> Instead of people, they're in the restaurant industry. They're buying biotechnology stocks. Right. The people in the chemical and they industry know nothing about, know nothing biotech. about it. The people in the chemical industry are buying oil stocks. Right. It's absolutely absurd. <laughs> people don't understand their natural advantages, yeah. and they don't use them. So th that's that's bad. Number one, but worse. Number two. Is they do, if you don't think you're a good ice skater, or if you're convinced you're not a good cellist, you're not going out and try it. But people are buying stocks anyway. Yeah. They're not discouraged. They just think it's a gamble. Yeah. So therefore, they go forward, and they, they bet on one stock for a week and a half, and it goes up, and they, they make $2 on it. Then they sell it, and they buy something else. When three years is over, all they've done is generate a lot of commissions, and they've probably lost money. That's a mistake. So your advice is what? If you don't understand a company, yeah. if you can't explain it to a 10-year-old right. in two minutes or less, <laughs> yes. don't own it. Because when it goes down, let's say the stock goes down two points. You won't understand what's going on. Do, what do you do? Do you buy more? Do you, do you, yeah. do you flip and, a coin? And chances are your broker doesn't either? You, they, he, he or she certainly doesn't know yeah. about it. <laughs> I mean, who knows what advanced, yeah. what all these things are with auto back planes and mega flops. Who knows what yeah. all these So buy what are. you know. Buy in your industry, buy what you know, buy local companies. Yeah, so, so suppose you, you don't have an industry. I mean, you know, you don't really... Well, you, well, you buy com local companies. Right. Companies in your own industry. Ten years after Walmart went public. Ten years after Walmart. Went public. Ten years after it went public. It's a 25-year-old company now. Right. You could have bought the stock and made 50 times your money on it. 50 times. This is, if you bought it ten years after... After it, it was public already. Yeah. It had already gone up five-fold. So you could have made 250-fold. Yeah. But I'm saying, let's say you were in a town. They came into it and they said... Boy, these prices are great. They're doing terrific. Yeah. I like the bargains. And you checked it out. You spent a little bit of work on it. Yeah. I mean, people are very careful. They, when they buy a dishwasher, they do some research. They'll put $10,000 in some right. stock they hear on a bus. So if you did a little bit of research, you'd say, Walmart's only 10% of the country. They're not even saturated there. Why can't they go to the rest of the country? So is this, this is more of the same. Is this it what it is? It's more of the same, plus I show examples. It's, it's a, a touch more... Detailed. It actually shows me in an action. Right. I picked 21 stocks early in 1992. Right. Some work, some don't. I follow those companies. Some of the companies, the fundamentals deteriorate. Some they improve. I watch those companies go through the year. I also explain the retail industry. I try and make it very simple. And I talk about a wonderful example. Is a seventh grade class. Yeah. The teacher of that read my book. And my first book that you were talking about, <laughs> that you, you and I did a show on That's that in right. Washington. Right. You remember that show? Right. This is right. a long time ago. She read the book, and I said, if you made it through fifth grade math, you can do it in the stock market. <laughs> yes. She says, okay. She started teaching it in seventh grade, right. seventh grade class. These kids had to study companies. Right. They had to look at their balance sheets to see if they're solvent, yeah. and they picked stocks. These stocks were up 69% over two years when the market was up only 20. And they picked stocks like Limited. They picked The Gap. Right. They picked Walt. They understood these companies. They also picked IBM. I right. lost money on that, too. Yeah. I mean, everybody <laughs> yeah, makes mistakes. Everybody did, yeah. But I'm saying this, is, this was... This was a school, St. Agnes' School in Arlington, Mass. Right. But in addition, in the decade of the 80s, there was 8,000 investment clubs. These are amateur sort of right. average people just investing. These investment clubs, 62% of them, of these clubs, beat the market. In the decade of the 80s, only 25% of professionals beat the market. Right, let me go back to one other subject. You, 
after you're coming back to Fidelity, aren't you? Aren't Just you, aren't on you a, going to do something? When, when I when I finish this book, I've been working about one or two right. days a week the last year and a half on this book. Right. Now I'm done with the book. I'm going to go back to maybe one day a week working with the younger analysts. Just listening to them, talking to them. I'm not telling them to buy Xerox, so you're not to sell Xerox. Your own lifestyle. Not totally. I'm not going to run another fund. Thirteen years was plenty of running a fund. I'm just going to work with younger analysts. Let them ask questions. I'll ask them questions. It's going to be a lot of fun. Now, do you still follow? Do you manage any money for anybody other than no, yourself? No, no, no. Manage. I manage money with other people for some charities. Right. But no, I don't manage anybody's accounts. You're not zero. doing some mutual fund, no, some pension zero. fund, no, some nothing. I'm out. Went fund. cold turkey. No. All right. You you cold got, turkey. Did you? you? Cold turkey. Now, are, are you happy you did this? I'm oh, obviously delighted. It's great. Yeah. No, and you it. like your new life? Oh, it's fabulous. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about the Clinton economic plan. What do you think of it? Yeah. Well, I think his theories are excellent. You know, I, we clearly which theories are excellent. Well, he claims that we're going to do more investing and less spending. Right. And that statement you can't argue with. Less consumption, more saving. You absolutely have to invest more in education. You have to invest more in companies. You have to invest less in just spending money. I mean, today people are encouraged to spend. You spend money. Let's say you put an addition on your house. Right. You spend money on that. That you can get a tax deduction because it, because it, you know, the interest on it is tax deductible. Mm -hmm. If you invest, if you take your money and put it in the bank, you're taxed at a very high rate. They have this incredibly unfair term. It's called unearned income. When you, every time I do all the income taxes, and, and I fill out the, the number for what you made, the money you put in the bank, it's crazy. called unearned income. What a t it's, it's an insulting term. But anyway, if you, if you buy a stock and you make money on it, you pay a 28% tax on it. Yeah. Guess what the capital gains rate is in Japan? Uh, capital gains rate in Japan is 10%. Zero. Zero. Right. I mean, we're not encouraging people to save. We're not encouraging people to invest. So We're you're encouraging in favor people the, to spend. You're in favor of the elimination of the capital gains tax that, that Bush proposed. Reducing it or yeah. eliminating it. And I'm glad that Clinton didn't raise it. I right. mean, he raised other taxes. This fairness thing, I understand. Uh, and, and what about this tax the rich business? You, you buy that? I, I think fairness, it's a debate what's fair. I, think, I certainly think raising taxes is appropriate if it's at the same time yeah. you cut the spending. It's a lot easier to raise taxes than cut spending. If we can cut spending and get government's share of the gross national product reduced, it'll be fair. But our country works very well. It's working extremely well. I mean, you just don't want it to get spin out of control. You don't buy into the stimulus package, though. Don't buy into that at all. You believe that we don't need to go out and create jobs Charlie, for we, people. Charlie, we've had eight recessions since World War II. We've got out of every one of them. This is number nine. There's nothing unique about the system. We'll get out of this one. In the decade of the 80s, the 1980s, we added 18 million jobs in the United yeah. States. Yeah, but as soon as you say that, as you know, people are saying, yeah, Peter, but look what we did. When Ronald Reagan came to the White House, yep. the deficit was what, $70 billion, mm -hmm. 65, mm -hmm. $70 billion, and now yeah. it's approaching $350 billion. Right, right. And the amount of money that right. we have to spend to right. pay off the interest on that debt yep. is saddling us and destroying us and I destroying what You're okay. right. I agree. You're right. I, I agree well, with that. Don't tell me how many jobs we created no, but, in the 1980s, because you I, can always create jobs if you're willing to... No, no, that, the government up. didn't create that. Right. The 500 largest companies in the 80s yeah. eliminated 3 million jobs. Eliminated 3 million, and we added 18 million. These 2.2 million businesses started. 2.2 million businesses started yeah. in the 80s. Now, some of them didn't make it. Right. But if an average, they have 10 employees today, that's 22 million jobs. Yeah. What, the only thing that creates wealth, the only thing that creates taxes to pay for all these wonderful things is jobs. There is something magic about jobs, and jobs come from companies starting. That's what I was trying to say. Small companies create Small jobs, right? create all the jobs. Yeah, right. So that's what I'm talking about. This is not voodoo economics. This is the real thing. <laughs> you have to encourage people to take some risk, to put their money out, and go start a business. It's a risky proposition. And, and you do that by what kind of government policies other than a zero capital gains or a 10% capital right. gains? Lower interest rates. What's rate? the capital gains at now? 20? 20, 28%. 28 plus, okay. it's the highest capital gains rate we've ever had in the history of this country. Right. It's never been this high. I mean, it's terrible how high the capital gains rate is. That's not encouraging people to invest. What you want, you want to have lower, say, you want to have lower interest rates, lower paperwork. People start a business now, and they have this much paperwork to fill out yeah, on that's forms. That's regulation. They go crazy but over regulation. But that's crazy. You've got to cut that out. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. But I mean, some, I mean, a lot I, of people say, say why without I... those kind of regulations, then people would be creating, dumping into the rivers and, and not protecting the no, environment. No, but these are regulations and, not, and what and not size? not protecting the health of their employees. I mean, look what happened down in my home yep. state of North yep. Carolina because of, you know, the fire they had down there. I mean, people say if you don't have some kind of government regulation and yep. companies aren't doing their job to protect their workers, yep. then this is not the kind of society But some of these want. regulations relate to the size of your right. paper clips. I mean, yeah, exactly. there's a lot of waste. I mean, some of this paperwork 
work is mind boggling. Sometimes you could do it with one piece of paper. Yeah, one, that's yeah, right. it. I mean, okay. I, that would be a good policy. Stay. I think Clinton it really wants to make it work. Yeah. The capitalist system works. Obviously, you want to protect the consumer, and, and business people carry to extreme when the oil monopoly and the steel monopoly. That's wrong, too. I mean, I think trust should be broken up. There is a role for government. IBM, what happened to them? IBM had a wonderful business. They used to go to companies like Fidelity, Chase Manhattan. They used to come and explain to these people <laughs> how to use computers. Yeah. They didn't know how to use computers. Yeah. They went to companies and it went in with very talented, experienced people. IBM. And ex IBM, right. and explained to people how to use computers. Today, all these companies, like Johnson & Johnson's, American Home, Bristol Myers, they have people in the company already that know computers backwards and forwards. Right. The same IBM people walk in with these solutions they don't need all so, those people. So all these companies took IBM's business away from no, them? No, no, they do internally. They have experts internally right. now that are right. trained in, it's called now management information systems. They have all these fancy right, acronyms right, for right. it. They have skilled people. All they want now is software and a cheap box. Right. They don't need all these. So IBM was dealing in a system that was very effective for three or four decades. Now the, the technology has moved to the chip. The technology has moved to the software. It's not the box. It's not the storage device. So what should IBM do? What should this board of directors of IBM, which is looking for a new chief executive officer, what should they be looking for? Well, I, mean, I hear people saying they ought to just, Mort Meyerson, the yeah. number two guy to Ross Perot down there, yeah. said maybe they ought to dismember the thing. Well, or maybe they ought to create all kinds yeah. of little entrepreneurial companies from within, yeah. break it up. They'll eventually, they have incredible technology. They, right. They're very skilled. They have a lot of determination. Right now, unfortunately, it's sad, they have too many employees. They have too many factories. They try to do it all themselves. They're, they're, they're working the right direction. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the direction they're going. They will turn it around. They're in a hard process because the, the technology is advancing all the time. What was the genius of Bill Gates and Microsoft, which now has a higher net worth than IBM, doesn't it? Well, he, there's a lot of bright people. Said, oh, my God, his, he, his net worth alone might be more than IBM's profits. I mean, you know, his, <laughs> oh, he, he, he meant him individually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. His brilliance, there's yeah. a lot of brilliant people, and, and a lot of luck. IBM adopted MS-DOS as the right. operating system. Right. They rushed the market with the first computer. They needed an operating system, and he had the only one. If they'd waited a couple years, they could have used their own. So MS-DOS became the basic operating system of every computer, whether it was a compact computer. The only computer system that didn't use it was Apple. Apple had their own operating system. Mm -hmm. So every computer that went out there all over the world needed MS-DOS. He uses, used that to come along with Windows. See, he was there. He was like the, the gasoline when people, whatever car, if you had, all, if you had, if you had the rights to all the gasoline, you don't care yeah. whose cars are. Or said another way, I mean, he, he, IBM was making all of these razors, and, and he was making all the razor blades. You got it right. right. Yeah, absolutely. And then there were other people making razors to use his, his <laughs> blades. Exactly. Yeah. He, so he, he had the, all the razor clones. blades yeah. around. No, he, obviously he's a bright person. Yeah. And, and rich. Yeah. And EDS, EDS, you know, Ross Perot came What do you think out. of Perot? I think he's a well-meaning, talented guy. He's done a lot of good things in education. Did you vote for him for president? I did. You did? Yeah. Perot was your guy? Yeah, I sure did. Why? Well, it was sort of a protest vote. Because, okay. I, because I know in our state, you know, I mean, in our state, Massachusetts. We, yeah, I know in Massachusetts, the Democrat was going to win That's anyway. Right. And I really thought his concepts of cutting down on the deficit and more investment. Ah, cutting down on the deficit is a good idea. Oh, it's absolutely a good idea. Right. It's a terrific idea. Give me five good stocks to watch, not to buy, but just to watch. Five ideas that you think where people are really on the right track and created a good business. Well, this I think... not touting stocks, okay. America. Okay. I just want to okay. know what Peter likes. Okay. Well, we have a company in Boston called Oba Pan. It's, yeah. it's a company that makes croissants and they make breads and they yeah. have a state-of-the-art bagel they're working on. <laughs> I can understand that company. <laughs> me too. They're only in about 20% of the country. They're starting to roll. Yeah. Right now, it's I think you know the price is fully priced, and I think now is the what, time. What's to, it selling for? What's fully priced? Oh, right. I mean it's 25 times next year's okay. earnings. Right. I mean that's right. very high. Right. But I think over the long period of time, I'm hoping the market goes down and the stock will go down, and I'm going to back up the truck and buy a lot of shares. <laughs> I think now is the time to look at cyclical stocks. I think the economy right. is going to get better around the world in '94. It's already getting better in '93 in the United States. And even better in '94 better in 94 because right now it's slumping in Germany and it's right, slumping in right, Japan. Right, right. So I think now's now the time. time to look at cyclical companies in the paper industry, the aluminum industry, the steel industry. They've cut the cost. They're the lowest cost producers in the world. And when things get better, they're going to make a lot of money. Okay, what about little small companies we should look at? Oh, there's tens of thousands. Well, name I, one. A small company? Well, yeah. I, I guess I'd say all about pans. Oh, small okay, or another one would be Jay Baker is a relatively small company. What do company. they do? It's a retailer yeah. or Supercuts. They do haircuts. That's a small company. <laughs>
Peter Lynch is back with a new book called Beating the Street. It is always interesting to have him here. Uh, one Up on Wall Street was one of the better bestsellers uh, ever to, about Wall Street, and, and it is very simple, which most things are very simple, uh, and when you understand them, you can understand uh, what makes the world work. I appreciate you being here. Thanks, Sean.